Sorry, buddy. Oh. Hello, CPAC. How you doing? Huh? Thank you. Matt, thank you for that second introduction. <laughs> uh, I understand there's some Ron Paul fans here. <clears throat> you know, Rand Paul, too. I'm the other Paul. Uh, Ron Paul is a friend, a colleague of mine, and he is a big Green Bay Packer fan. So the rest of you have got to get on board, all right? <laughs> um, look, this is halftime. We, you know, let's keep going with the Packer analogy here. We just went through the first half. And the first half of this fight was one where we saw the left un, unplugged. And we saw what they want to do. And the people spoke up. We have one of those great founding principles in this country that we have government by consent of the governed. And you know what? The governed did not consent, and there they went out of the majority. And we have a conservative majority in the House of Representatives now. Right now, we are in a whole bunch of policy fights. We're talking about health care and economics and budgets and deficits and debts and this and that. And in these policy fights, you can often get lost in the details. You fail to see the forest through the trees. And so when we look at these policy fights, let's take stock with what this country is all about. Let's make sure we remember what is the purpose and nature of our government. We cannot lose sight of the wisdom of Lincoln, who said and repeated that our rights were given by nature and nature's God. We cannot lose sight of the fact that Washington said that the happiness of human beings is a moral case. We cannot take for granted the case for limited government and individual freedom. And so what we got in this last election to put us in this halftime period is a reaction from the country. And they said, we want something in there to put a stop to this. They said, we want to restore the Constitution and our founding principles. You know what the first thing we did when we took the gavel from Nancy Pelosi? We read, we, we, yeah, no, we traded in for a different gavel, actually, but uh, <laughs> we read the Constitution. And you know what? When we were reading the Constitution, I don't remember the provision that said we need to over-subsidize some industries, over-regulate others, and mandate that all of you buy government-defined health insurance. I forgot about that provision. But what they also said to us in this last election was we want you to engage in the battle of ideas. No, we want you to engage in the battle of an idea, and that's what this is all about. We are engaged in the battle of the American idea. What is that? Our rights come from nature and God, not from government. You see, I've been doing this for a while. This is my seventh term. I've been in committee hearing at the committee hearing with Charlie Rangel and Pete Stark and all of those folks. There is a different world view. And the world view is that the government gives us our rights. That these old ideas, liberty, freedom, free enterprise, natural rights, these old ideas are obsolete. They don't work anymore. Society is too complex. We need new rights. I can't tell you how many times I heard during this health care debate at the Blair House and everywhere else, health care is a right, meaning this is a right that we, the government, are giving the people. Well, if government gets to give us our rights, that means government can ration our rights, government can restrict our rights, government can decide who, when, where, and how we get these rights. That's the crowd we've got right now. So what I'm basically trying to say is what we have is a systematic replacement of the rule of law by the consent of the governed with the rule of man. Whether it's our monetary policy, our regulatory policy, our health care policy, or our fiscal policy, it is Washington knows best. Life is too complex. We'll get the details worked out for you. Well, you know what? I don't think the president really got the message of this last election. You know, we all enjoy going to the State of the Unions and listening to what they say. And you heard some of the words of American exceptionalism. You heard, I mean, if you close your eyes, you heard words that sound almost Reagan-esque. 
But then when you look at the details, you know what I heard? A double down in the same direction. I heard the path to prosperity is more stimulus. No, excuse me, more investment. Well, you know what? The path to prosperity is not through solar shingles and high-speed trains. It's through releasing individual freedom. So where are we right now? Coming out of the gates, we started cutting our own budget. Coming out of the gates, we repealed Obamacare. Just this week, you know what? You know what's great about the debate we're having this week in the House? We're having a debate about how much we should cut spending. Not whether we should spend more, but how much less. And you know what? Next week, we're bringing the bill to the floor. That's going to cut spending more than the Pledge for America said we would cut. We're bringing up. Let me put it this way. Our debt problem is not just a fiscal challenge involving dollars and cents. It's a moral challenge involving questions of principle and purpose. The size of the budget is a symptom of deeper causes, and it points to different ideas about government. We basically need to ask ourselves, what should government be doing? What sort of people do we want to be? What kind of character do we want our children and grandchildren to have? The answers to these questions dictate the size of government. If you believe government should be doing more to solve every social problem, you cannot also believe in limited government. Society's potential problems are unlimited. So a government that would solve problems without limit must necessarily have power without limit to do it. You know, today, there are a lot of people who are saying that modern society is just too complicated for the average man and woman to deal with. This is a long-standing argument. We've heard it since the 1920s and before. We've heard it a lot since the last mortgage crisis and the financial meltdown. They tell us we need more financial experts and technocrats making more details, more decisions without political interference from, from, from Congress or from the likes of you. That's what they're basically telling us. Well, if we choose to have a federal government that tries to solve every problem, and then as long as society keeps getting more and more complex, government's going to have to keep growing along with it. The rule of law by the people must be reduced, and the arbitrary discre discretion by experts must be expanded under this worldview. You know how this story ends. Just look across the Atlantic Ocean. If the American person cannot handle the complexity in his or her own life, and only government experts can, then that basically means that the government's going to have to direct the average American how to live his or her own life. Freedom becomes a diminishing good. So if we believe that the founding principles are, so, are now obsolete, that they're not good enough, that we need more, that is the major flaw in the progressive argument. They have an even bigger flaw in the progressive argument. It is this. It assumes that there must be someone or some few people who have all the knowledge and information. We just have to find, train, and hire more experts to run government agencies. One of the people who founded my political thinking was Friedrich Hayek. He called this notion collectivism's fatal conceit. The idea that a few bureaucrats know what's best for all society or possess more information about human wants and needs than millions of free individuals interacting in a free market is both false and arrogant. It has guided collectivists for two centuries down the road to serfdom, and the road is littered with their wrecked utopias. The plan always fails. The truth is a lot more humble. Every individual person is unique, and each contributes his or her own talents and knowledge. A free society becomes more fulfilling and prosperous when these people join together and collaborate with one another. This is where genius and innovation take root, in individual pursuit, in voluntary exchange, not in government bureaucracy and coercive dictates. There is no government wizard who knows everything about all of our collective needs and our collective talents. Each person is the world's top expert on his or her own unique skills. The 
people as a whole understand society as a whole, no matter how complicated it gets. This humble truth was recognized in the birth of Western civilization, an idea that is under stress and attack right now. It's the basis of democratic capitalism. It guided those who incarnated the American idea in a constitution that recognizes the natural limits of government. Free markets under the rule of law will always be the rock of our prosperity and there is no substitution to that. You know, those who conceive of this new nation dedicated in liberty held liberty was a moral cause. Liberty includes freedom of commerce and contract and the privileged place in the law of the family. The freedom of every person to prosper presupposes the freedom and right of every person to, born, to be born and to live. Economic productivity begins and ends with the needs and purposes of the family household. Here's what I'm trying to say. Economic conservatism and social conservatism come from the same moral root. You, you can't give up one to defend the other and they must never be separated. There are some who believe that our problems have overrun our principles and that we need something else. I'm not going to question the sincerity or the good intentions, but without the American idea, there is no future for freedom. In the long story of civilizations, great empires have risen and great empires have declined. Exhausted peoples chose to let others take care of them instead of caring for themselves. Like those before us, we have this choice, and this tipping point is coming to us. We can decide to give our children a future that's going to be less than what our parents and our grandparents had. We can buy into the fable that there is no future unless government wins the future for us. We can choose to relegate America to another chapter in the history of declining nations, but why on earth would we make that choice? All that stands between us today and abundance tomorrow is the burden of public debt, the government's appetite to spend, and the bureaucrats' passion to regulate. We can lift that burden, and here's what we need to do now that we're in the second half. We owe it to the country to give them a choice of two futures. We owe it to the country to let them choose in 2012, not let the bureaucracy make it happen automatically. Here is what I see 2012 as being all about. And our job as conservatives in the House is to make sure that 2011 goes right so that 2012 goes well. We owe you the choice. Do you want that opportunity society, that limited government with the safety net, based upon the founding principles of economic liberty and individual freedom? Or do you want the cradle-grave European-style social welfare state? You want to turn that hammock into a safety net that lulls people to lives of complacency and dependency that drains them of their incentive and their will to make the most of their lives? That's the choice in 2012. And so we owe you, we owe each other to keep each other accountable to make sure that in 2012, America makes its choice about what kind of future it wants to be. The numbers are cruel. The policies are certain. The trajectory is clear. We know where the country's headed, and it is not too late to turn it in the right direction. And so we are in this moment. We are at a moment in history where we will get to choose. And if we do our jobs right, you'll have a very clear choice. And you know what makes me excited? You know what makes me optimistic? If you just give the country a choice, we'll make the right one. You know... Packers were the sixth seed. We had 16 players. We had 16 people on injured reserve, and we are the world champions now. Right. Winston Churchill said the Americans can be counted upon to do the right thing only after they've exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> that is where we are. This is our time. The second half is ours. 
2012 is ours, and this is the time where America takes its country back. Thank you very, very much.